Well, good afternoon. You just guys just got done eating. Your blood sugar hasn't done anything yet. <laughs> so you can't use that as an excuse. So I'm the director of healthcare services, and uh, we are a worldwide company that does healthcare all over the world. I just got back from Brazil, uh, starting up a few projects down there. We do about 400 operating rooms, surgery centers across the country each and every day. So at some point, in my day, I get a phone call that CMS is here, AAAHC is here, Joint Commission's here, DMV is here, <laughs> and the whole myriad of other letters, alphabets, and, and soup. So in order for me to pinpoint my presentation to you, I've got some questions by simply raising your hand and you letting me know you probably Question heard of all these organizations over the last two days. So the first four or five of my slides, no, there was no collaboration with the rest of the course instructors about what we were going to say, and everybody was going to add it to the slides. It just happens to be that everyone seems to be connected around the policies and the procedures and what we need to do to clean and disinfect or run an ambulatory surgery center. Some of them that I want to point out, though, that are good references, you already know about the ARN and OSHA and EPA and Joint Commission and the CDC, but a lot of people don't know about this one here, which is the AHE, which is the Association for the Healthcare Environment. They're the ones who set the standard, the best practice for cleaning and disinfecting of operating rooms. Those are the people who actually are the group that sits down and writes the standard on how on operating rooms to be terminally cleaned step by step. ARN says you have to do terminal cleaning, CMS says you have to do ter terminal cleaning, accrediting bodies say you have to do terminal cleaning, but nobody ever tells you what the standard is for terminal cleaning. Well, that happens to be the Association for the Healthcare that Environment. That will give you that information. There's videos on how to clean, they have training series for that, they have a best practice policy and procedures book that you can get the CD write your policies and procedures for cleaning and disinfecting. Anything to make it easy is the way I look at it. I am not going to go through these slides. You've probably seen all of this you want to see. It's there. You can actually give this present part of this presentation to the people who are doing your cleaning, your in-house people, and educate them from this slide presentation. But I'm not going to go through <coughs> antiseptic, clean, decontaminate, disinfect. I think everybody's done a good job of that. We talk about cleaning and we say, well, we're going to clean the operating rooms. That's great. But you've got to talk about the other piece of that. And the other piece of that is we have to disinfect the operating rooms. And so I want to help try to get past some of the myths about cleaning and disinfecting the operating room on products and processes that I think sometimes we forget that we have to do it a certain way in order for the disinfecting process to actually occur. So one of the things is we already know that microbes hide in soil, they hide in dirt, they eat, they eat, that's the things they like to hide in and feed from. The problem is that you simply just can't clean and you simply can't just disinfect. You have to be able to clean and disinfect, and it has to be in a one-step process. I've heard people say, well, we'll go clean it, and then we'll come back with a disinfectant and clean it again. You can't do that. It's got to be a one-step process. And the reason it has to be a one-step process is that the process of cleaning, all you're doing is really taking that applicator and spreading more germs, pathogens, microbes, whatever you want to call them, across that what wasn't already contaminated. That's why it has to be a one-step process. It has to be able to have a surfactant, which is the cleaner part, which is the stuff that loosens the dirt, and the disinfectant part so it can do its job. Unfortunately, when we talk about product and chemicals, the sales guys out there selling this stuff are kind of um, less than truthful with their products. Because they say there's a great disinfectant, and you go, okay, is it a great cleaner? Ceiling cleaning procedure. 
is a written procedure with a drawing, meaning that you take an 18-inch microfiber flat mop head on an extension pole, and basically what you're doing is going down the ceiling and back up, down the ceiling and back up, down the ceiling and back up. So it's just the pattern. You start from the entry point, you keep going all the way to the next corner of the wall. So you would start over there, you ended up over there to clean the ceiling. Wall washing, every day, just like the ceiling. It's part of terminal cleaning. We're talking about your viewpoint on having a floor stripped and... Oh, yeah, that's a, thank you. You didn't mention that, so... Yeah, I did. How many people want to... You have your, your operating room stripped and waxed. Why? The patient's looking at the ceiling. Make sure the ceiling is clean. The reason we don't strip and wax floors in the operating room, one, it's just a huge cost that you don't need. All the products that you're going to use are going to eat the wax. You drop betadine on the floor, it's going to eat the wax. Well, that's why we get a strip of wax, because <laughs> why the crazy orthopedist keeps throwing them yeah. betadine. <laughs> well, the thing about it is, is that the, that betadine is going to eat through that wax anyway. You're still going to have to